Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today's topic is going to be dissociation. Uh, it's a topic I've not already covered. It's something that affects me in my life every single day to a quite extreme amount, I guess. Um, I'm not going to be going so much into how it affects me. I'm going to be doing more like a general video on this. We're kind of like, what is it? How it happens? Why? Um, and maybe I'll do a more personal one if there's any interest or if people want to know more about how it can affect people on a bit of an in more in-depth look. So yeah, let's crack on. So what is it? Um, dissociation is basically the brain's protective mechanism when there's extreme and repeated torture or trauma, abuse, and that is the trauma could be something that wouldn't be classed as trauma to someone else, but would to that person. So it doesn't have to be something like uh, a sexual assault or being hit or anything like that. Something that that person found traumatic. Um, it usually will be develop but under the age of nine so if you have trauma under the age of nine that is usually when you will have a higher chance of becoming dissociated you will dissociate in life you may develop alters splits parts systems whatever you want to call it um i call my parts just the others or my parts i don't really like the word alter don't know why um yeah so it's basically like a protective mechanism so say you have a really bad event happen to you and your brain is like, I can't handle this. I'm going to shut down and let another part of the brain come forward. And that part of the brain can handle it while I'm gone. And so this is how these splits develop is that each time there's a trauma, part of the brain will dissociate. So it will go kind of recede into the mind almost. And another part will come forward to experience the abuse, the trauma, whatever's happening. Um, yeah, so the definition, I've got a definition written right here. It says... A psychological experience where people feel disconnected from their sensory experience, sense of self or personal history. It can be a symptom of um, many things such as DID, MPD or uh, other dis dissociative illnesses. So MPD and DID are the same thing. Multiple personality disorders and uh, dissociative identity disorder. There are various subtypes. There's some with amnesia involved. There's some with no not amnesia involved. So it varies. There's different types. The main um, the, the main three types of association that you get in terms of diagnosis is DID, dissociative identity disorder, which is what used to be called multiple personality disorder. So this is what I have where I have other parts of my brain that have entirely different personalities to me. They have entirely different likes, dislikes, triggers, everything. Um, the second type is derealization, which is where you don't believe that anything around you is real. It feels uh, off. It feels like there's something wrong, just very unreal. And the third type is depersonalization, which is where you don't feel connected to yourself and your surroundings. And you may feel like you're watching a movie and you're not actually a part in the movie. You're just watching the movie on the screen. And yet that's your life. Um, so talked a little bit about why people get it so it's always brought on by trauma so if someone has dissociation there has been some form of trauma whether they remember that or not um this is what i have read anyway from all my research and things like that and what i've learned and what i know about myself um dissociation is linked to trauma so especially under the age of nine i don't know if dissociation can happen after that age or at least the, the splits in the brain unless it was maybe very severe and again, repeated abuse. Um, so the symptoms, we'll talk about the symptoms a little bit. Um, I've got quite a long list. So a strong feeling of being distant or separate to the world. We have amnesia, not all the time. It may be things like, um, it could be as big as your name, where you live, who you are, your children, your husband, like anything like that, you could forget anything. That's called amnesia fugue, I believe, or fuge. Um, and it's where you forget important things. There's also like short-term and long-term long memory issues. So I have both of those. I find it very hard to um, create a new memory unless I really focus on an event repeatedly and repeatedly. And even then it might go. Um, long-term, I've lost a lot of my personal memories, even the good stuff. Uh, it's just gone, just gone. <laughs> Um, sometimes I'll get like a trigger and it'll bring a memory back or like a smell will take me back to somewhere I was as a kid. I think we all have had that experience to say being on a tube station or a train and smelling someone's perfume or their aftershave that reminds us of someone we know. 
um, and we suddenly feel like that person is there. We feel their presence almost. So it's that kind of thing. Um, and now, so personally, when I have amnesia, sometimes it's fine and I've just done that whatever I've done, anything safe, it doesn't mean I'll maybe time it to flat a bit, um, taking the dog for a walk. There's other times though when there was one point where this would happen every time would be that I would come back and I'd self-harmed and I'd look down and there'd be blood pouring everywhere and I would just stay and it was horrific. Um, I didn't know who had done it. Was it me? Had I been attacked? Like, I had no memory so it's really hard to put the pieces together sometimes and work out what's actually gone on. I mean, I guess I knew with the self harm it was me because there'd be a razor blade there, there'd be a towel there. So I, I knew that I'd probably done it to myself, but I have no recollection of this. No recollection maybe of even wanting to cut. I just dissociated and the part of my head that came to the front did that. There's been other times I've kind of come back and I'm in the middle of a road and I've had to like run across and that is so disorientating to be like, where the hell am I? And then see a car coming at you, beeping its on, and you're like, shit, I'm running. <laughs> um, it, yeah, very disorientating, quite scary. I have people come up to me that don't, well, I don't know them, but they know me. They may know my dog's name, my dad's name, things about my, where I live, my friends. And to me, these people are complete strangers. I would honestly swear I've never met them before. Um, and yet they know me. They know things about me. And so I obviously know now that I've met them in well where one of my parts has been more forward and i've been more backwards so when another part's been at the front and they must obviously have this interaction with these people who even though they call me becky which i've just noticed that they don't call me other names so i guess my parts will come forward as becky whether it's me there or not i don't know that's interesting i never twigged that before so carrying on with the um symptoms there's feeling or hearing more than your own voice in your own head or externally um let's see feeling as though you're in a deep fog that your brain is cloudy that you can't think properly it's like wading through mud with every thought it takes a lot of effort and energy to just do simple tasks and even to remember to do simple tasks sometimes i personally just forget to eat i forget to drink i'm rubbish i don't trust myself to put the oven on because i've nearly started fires a couple of times recently doing that um it affects a lot of different things in your life um yeah so we mentioned with the depersonalization feeling like you're watching a movie screen or that you're um like an extra in a movie but you're not the star you're just watching it from a distance and kind of observing personally for me and i've noticed that i've had this my entire life when i have a memory and i think back on it i don't see myself in the memory as i saw in the memory like from what i saw with my eyes i will be here or like over here and I'll see myself and I'll see the event um and I'm guessing that's a dissociative thing maybe other people do it I don't know let me know please if you do that too let me know because I found no one else that does and I feel like a freak <laughs> so yeah let me know that'd be cool um so yeah it's like it's like looking at a screen you don't feel like it's you you don't feel connected to yourself who you are you even your body can feel alien People have issues of thinking that maybe part of their body is dead or it's someone else's. Um, you don't feel connected to like family, work, school, anything that used to be important to you. You may still care about it, but it's very hard to focus on it, to concentrate on it, to be able to put the effort and the work in to do the things you need to do without either dissociating and losing progress or dissociating and not doing it. Um, yeah, dissociation gets in the way of a lot of simple things. I mean, for example, like I said, put, cooking a meal. Say you want to cook a pizza, so you put the oven on, you put the pizza on the tray, you put the tray in the oven, shut the door, walk off. I would then set two alarms usually for my, uh, my oven, one at like five minutes before it's due, and then one when I need to go and take it. And I had two or three times recently, it's got to the point where I don't remember the alarms going off and I'm smelling burning and I'm like... That can't be good. <laughs> um, and so I run to the kitchen, shut the door so the fire alarm don't go off just in case, open the, the oven door, and it's just been like smoke billowing. It was scary. Like, I could have started a fire. Um, and I wouldn't care too much about me in a fire, but, like, my dog, my neighbours, like, that would be terrible. So, we, like, even small tasks, small daily tasks are an issue with dissociation. It doesn't matter 
if it might be easy to 99% of the world, sometimes it, it can make it very difficult to do the basics. Um, so continuing on with the symptoms, uh, if going more into DID again, the dissociative identity disorder, they may have splits or alters, parts, others. Uh, it's the whole thing. So the host, who is the person that is forward most, so Becky, me, is the host. You then have alters, or whatever you want to call them, who are other parts in the brain, completely, to me, as people. So they're as in-depth and as complicated as people. Um, they come forward sometimes, and if I go and they don't always feel safe enough to come forward, it looks like I'm just absolutely vacant, falling asleep maybe, um, because my head's lowered, my eyes are closed. And I think they're like watching and listening, but they're not, uh, they don't feel safe enough to come forward and be like, oh, hi, it's Hope here, or hi, it's Caleb here. So they just watch and just keep an eye on things. Even if my eyes are open, it's like a protective thing. They keep, like they, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, like they keep my aura safer. Like they make sure no one touches me. They make sure that I'm somewhere more comfortable, like little things like that. Um, and these splits or these parts can have completely different personalities and opinions and ideas and beliefs and views on the world views on the same people I, there's people i love that my voices really don't like um fortunately now the people i love my voices either have grown it, like it used to or they're adjusting and they're believing me when i say they're safe people um i guess because over time they've proven that to us uh and so yeah that's that's like the main symptoms i guess um so things like amnesia blackouts, dissociating in terms of not knowing what you've done, dissociating in terms of having another part of your, your brain come forward, um, feeling as though things are unreal, that things you're looking through things through like fog or a mist, feeling like you're watching yourself on a movie screen or like that you're well outside your body and you're not just watching everything from a distance. There's a lot to it um, and one that affects me in a, possibly the worst way almost is the derealization feeling that nothing's real because then you're like if nothing's real then this pain and everything i'm going through it's for nothing if this isn't real why bother like you know if you're in reality you can say this matters like i've got one shot i need to make this count but in my head it's like well it's not real so it doesn't really matter right i mean i care about the people i, I love i don't want to hurt them and i don't want to hurt anyone but especially the people i love but then you do think well none of us are real the people i care about aren't real i'm not real and it just like is a whole rabbit hole that messes you up so i, I don't really have any advice on how to deal with that i just wanted to let you know that you're not alone if you do go through that um i call it the matrix because when i first started being aware of it i'd see like a blueprint almost like in the matrix films except instead of green numbers it was like a blue like lines and the numbers were all blue um, I'd see things as like a blueprint. So for example, this kind of coke here would be like, there'd be a line down the middle, the line around here, a line around the middle there. And it would be like all the, the different numbers that describe that thing, whether it was like a number for the color, a number for how many letters were on it, a number for how many different texts were, like how high it was, how wide it was, like anything. I couldn't tell what the numbers always were, but I knew it was numbers describing the things. Um, and see, I, for me, when I'm talking about the world not being real, I'll use the phrase the matrix just because it's the closest thing people know to be similar, I guess, that they can kind of relate to a little bit in knowing what I mean. Um, I don't really believe in most of the rest of the matrix, but there's a lot of it that I think is like almost truth in plain sight. Uh, it's a very interesting film. Just be careful if you watch it when you do have derealization. It'll mess you up. Yeah, excuse me. So yeah, just be careful. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about how it may present itself in behaviours, maybe people's beliefs and thought patterns. So they may be emotionally distant, they may appear physically distant or vacant, like they're not listening, um, that they're not paying attention, that they don't care. You might think because they're forgetting things that what you told them isn't important to them, and I can guarantee you that is not true. I forget so many things that I try to really remember in my head um, and hold on to as much as I can and it just goes. It's just part of dissociation. You can't stop it. You can do things like make lists and write notes and all those things help but memory wise in your brain it's really hard for, for me at least to get that to work again. Um, 
And talking about that is memory loss, memory lapses, not knowing where the last hour or two hours or days or weeks went. I mean, obviously, days and weeks is rare. It can be even months or years. You hear stories of people turning up in a state in America that they never lived in. that are five states south of where they, they were originally missing from their family. And it turns out they had amnesia from dissociation, had no clue what was going on, didn't know who they were and just left. Um, it, it terrifies me to think that, that the brain can do that, to just cut ties to everything. And for that person to then not even know that they're missing the people they've left, it's kind of scary. Um, so other issues on how it may present itself is concentration difficulties. That's a big one, especially for me. Uh, give me a simple sum. I can do maths, but if it involves like more than two steps, I'm fucked. Just can't do it. My brain will not go like more than two steps forward at a time. And it's really frustrating. And I know that I'm not alone in that from what I've read. Um... It's, it is very hard. I mean, even to just stay focused with hearing the voices alone is hard. Never mind then the emotions that come with that and the emotions that they're having. My surroundings, how I'm feeling that day. There's a heck of a lot of contributor, contributors to kind of how well I'll be able to focus that day, how well I'll remember things, how well I'll function. Um, you may appear like you're spaced out, which is a common one. Um... Someone with dissociation, especially DID, may look like they're daydreaming or they're just not paying attention, not listening to you. This is usually because they're dissociating or they're going inward, as I would describe it. Um, and another part is coming forward or another part is starting to watch to see what's happening and, and assessing the situation, whether it's safe or not. Um, they may appear like they're not mentally present. They may be unaware of their surroundings, um, people talking to me or you, people talking to you, um, roads around you may not really be that safe if you're, if you're at that point because you're not conscious of what is physically around you at that moment. Um, they may say things that they don't really agree with or that they would normally say that, it would, that is out of character um, or maybe rude, upsetting, hurtful. I have um, a part called Caleb, and he's 14 to 16. I'd wager maybe 15, 16, more than anything. Um, and he is very sarcastic. He can be very cruel. He can be very rude. And yet, after thinking about it for a while, I've realised it's all a protective mechanism. And this is the key thing with dissociation. It's a protective mechanism. It's not there to make your life worse. It's not there to make your life harder. It, was, it happened because your brain had to protect you at a certain point and that was the only way it knew how to do it it's a perfectly natural thing to happen in the brain um and in fact one percent of all people in the world have dissociation that's a lot of people that's 100 <laughs> sorry <laughs> 100 um i mean that yeah that's insane and it just shows how deep this goes because this is not the DID is an illness that psychiatrists will argue about and say oh no it's not real people are just making up they think they have multiple personalities but it's just them acting out their fantasies and different people whatever crap they want to come up with um but personally having dissociation myself it's real i couldn't create these people with all their little in-depth intricacies and their traits and their likes and dislikes and like i, I just couldn't I, i'm not that creative um like I'm not saying that there aren't people that fake this illness. Of course there are. There's people that fake every illness. Um, but I would, in my opinion, and from what I experience, it is most definitely real. There is no way I could say that any other way or any more clearly. DID, dissociation, is completely real. Um, and just because someone hasn't seen it for, them, for themselves or experienced it themselves and they can say it doesn't exist, well, that's fine, that's normal. You know, you people don't believe in God without evidence in their mind. Whether it's evidence for someone else, it doesn't matter. Evidence for them. It's a similar thing with dissociation, I think. It's once you've seen it and you've experienced, or you've experienced it, you know it's real. I knew a lass when I was going to her voices group, um, and she was a lovely girl, but she was very troubled. And she would switch so often. Like, with me, it's a bit slower most of the time. Um unless I'm really like elevated in my arousal levels but it was maybe every let's see, 30 seconds she'd have a completely different accent voice 
age, likes, dislikes, how she talked, the words she used. And you just think, you can't fake that. No one could keep her up long enough to, to get a diagnosis of DID. It's, it would be exhausting. Like, it's exhausting having it, but faking it, I think, would actually be even fucking harder. Like, sorry, I'm going to talk about it. It just gets to me. Um, so people may say things like they don't feel real, that things feel distant, or that they're watching themselves from afar. Um, they may self-harm. They may use drugs as a coping tool. Certain drugs can make it worse. Ketamine is a dissociative. So I would always warn people about that. If you are... If you have any issues with dissociation, be careful with ketamine because it can make you a lot more ill. <laughs> it's basically the word, yeah, a lot more. It's like a rabbit hole. You fall down it and you're screwed. Um, personally, for me, cannabis, I don't want to say it helps because it does make me dissociate more, I think, because I'm more relaxed in some ways. So my brain, in some ways, I think, finds it easier to go into that state of mind. But it calms me down, it numbs my emotions, and with that, that numbs my alters, my parts, and that keeps them on a, a kind of a even keel a bit more. Um, but yeah, just be careful, because drugs affect everyone differently. Just because it keeps me calm doesn't mean it's not going to cause you psychosis. Like, everyone is different with a drug. You could have a million people take the same drug, same strength, same strain, strain absolutely everything the same. And I bet you that nearly every single one would have a different reaction. In fact, probably everyone. They may have similarities and commonalities, but I bet you everyone would be different. So just be careful with drugs when you do dissociate. It can make it a lot worse. Um, ketamine, solvents, weed. I would wager they're the three that can be the worst. So just carrying on with how it may present itself. Uh, people may become a little clumsy when they're dissociating. Personally, I can't feel the floor under my feet sometimes when I'm dissociating. And it's like, I know it's there because I can see it and it's holding me up. But there's just not that connection between the ground and my feet. And it just makes me a bit like wobbly, like I'm a bit drunk. So look out for that. Um, problems handling emotions is a big one. That's like the core of dissociation is we dissociate when we have an emotion that we can't handle. Most people, it's negative emotions. Personally, for me, it's any emotion. It doesn't whether that mean really whether it's good or bad. Um emotion just scares me it's something i can't handle very well so yeah mainly negative emotions can affect the idea or dissociation and cause it to become worse but it doesn't always have to be just negative emotions um there may be also things like sleep disturbances so insomnia nightmares not wanting to go to bed um staying up all night and sleeping through the day because that feels safer um your perception of time can change a lot so it might either speed up so a day seems like you've only been awake three hours or it can slow down it feels like three hours feels like you've been awake a day um that's variable really um another thing is a high pain threshold or a high pain tolerance um i think because when you're dissociated you don't really feel your body as much you're not connected to the body as much and so if you're in discomfort or you're in pain, it just kind of gets pushed down a bit in your consciousness and you're just not as aware of it. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how it affects me briefly. So you get a bit of an understanding of what people have told me about how I appear. So you might recognize some of these things in yourself. You might recognize some of these things in a loved one, a friend, someone you know. So basically, apparently, I go quiet. Um, I put my head down, my eyes close, my eyelids flutter. My breathing gets shallow, um, I may stop breathing and then suddenly take big gasps of air. Uh, I may be crying and upset quite hysterically and then all of a sudden, calm. And that's usually when Adam comes. Adam's like the, the strong silent type, as Andrea put it, and <laughs> he loved that. Um, and like, he just comes when everything's too much to handle and so I can be so, so upset and yet he comes forward and then I just get a bit of relief. He takes the brunt of it. So it may appear to someone that I'm hysterically upset and then suddenly I'm just instantly calm. And I think that probably looks a bit weird. Like, okay, she was crying her eyes out a minute ago and now now she's silent. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a part of dissociating. Um, sudden gulps of air. Um, I'm made worse by physical contact, especially if no one asks me first. Someone comes up to me and tries to put their arm around me without telling me I'm dissociating. That is a really bad move never, never touch someone dissociating without their permission. If you ask them and they don't answer, do not say that as permission. 
if you get a yes that is the only time you're allowed right and i would suggest arms hands or shoulders a hug might be good avoid legs um avoid the chest and the body just as a general kind of thing i am not everyone obviously is going to have issues with their body and things like that but it's just something to think about so i may talk to people that others can't see so my parts i may talk out loud to them sometimes um i don't know how that really appears because i think i'm pretty good at keeping it in my head i guess when i get to like a very distressed point i sometimes yell at them so i wonder if maybe that's why she put that um things feel unreal i wrote matrix simulation glitches so yeah i saw glitches as well people walking down the street and then just disappearing um there was, there was a lot of weird stuff and it's hard for me to tell if it's derealization or if it's just me seeing the world as it is like how can you tell when you're ill and psychotic and how can you tell when you're well and just seeing the world for how fucked up it is <laughs> who knows i really need the answer to that so if anyone knows let me know um so i get memory loss short term and long term i can't form new memories very well i lose awareness of what's around me um and it's it's kind of hard handling and balancing everyone in one go because well, one thing that might calm hope down could upset caleb and then so to calm down caleb i upset adam and it's like it can go round and round and it's really hard to find that balance to, to get everyone calm um and so now we're going to talk about what you can do to help someone who is dissociating some of these you can do for yourself if it's you dissociating but i know how hard it is to be able to ground yourself when you're in that moment and there's no one around to kind of like right come on prompt and kind of get you to put your mind onto that so these are some things that you could do for someone so is one number one is get them to a safe environment get them somewhere quiet with as little stimulation as possible somewhere they can either sit down lie down be comfortable or at least just have a breather without there being a lot of people around a lot of noise a lot of hubbub um the less stimulation the better definitely um some medications are helpful so there's no actual medication that's officially prescribed for DID or dissociation but there are medications that they do give to kind of help with it so you can have antidepressants antipsychotics mood stabilizers um they're like regular medication you can have then there's also like PRN which is meds you take when you need them um and that could be something like the razapam diazepam zopiclone promethazine there's all sorts um let's see psychotherapy of course is really the big one i think with dissociation the key to treatment and the key to recovery is the psychological work that terrifies me because it's very long-term work it's not just like 10 weeks with a psychiatrist and boom you're fixed like with cbt um it, you've got three different phases to it you've got the stabilization therapy you then have the trauma therapy and then let me just check and then the integration, which is where you're bringing your parts together. Stabilisation therapy, the first stage, can take at least a year and a half. For the stage one. Like, that's insane. I mean, obviously, some people will do it in less, some people will do it in more, because we're all different. But that is a rough guide that I was given um, by someone who works a lot with DID and dissociative disorders. So I, I take a word for it. She knows what she's on about. Um... So yeah, carrying on, what does help? Stress management. So having maybe a plan, if this happens, I will do this. I will go here, I will call this person, I will text this person. So we have a little list of things, like if this thing happens, this is what I will do. And that can help, A, you get into a routine, and then you also have to know what to do, and you can just bring yourself back, you can ground yourself a little using that. But also, it's a good way of prompting yourself, like, and looking at it and be like, all right, this is what I need to do. So it could be, if I feel I'm going to dissociate, and you could write this down like a little bit of card, put it in your pocket or your purse, whatever, I will call this person, I will text this person, I will put this song on, um, I will take some PR in, like, whatever it is for you, I'll have a bath, I'll have a walk, I'll pet the dog. Whatever it is, find something that you can think, in this situation, that is what I will do. Because if you have a plan, it makes you feel a lot more prepared, and that can help your anxiety levels, which will reduce your dissociative levels. So it's kind of just doing everything in the circle because every little bit affects the others. So if you can just stop one issue, one circle being too bad, you can then kind of change the rest of it. Um, 
so voice dialoguing is very helpful so this is something that i did when i was hearing voices i never really knew them as dissociative parts and it's someone talking to your voices through you so for example my worker um uh, who was amazing by the way i don't know if she'll see this video but thank you very much you were bloody brilliant mariska um and i miss you i hope you're good you uh you helped me a lot and gave me a lot more understanding with the work that you got me to do so thank you um but basically mariska would talk to my voices so say she's talking to hope she would say so hope what do you think about this and then i would wait for hope's response and i would say it out loud or hope would come forward and she would say it that was a lot rarer more rare usually it was me just saying what she'd said to me um sometimes i felt i had to edit it especially like with the angry people when they got like angry i didn't want to be like saying fuck off you fucking you know, like because i don't want to upset people but like, i also didn't want to lie so it's a difficult one but having someone who can talk to them on your behalf can be really helpful because sometimes they don't always listen to you at least mine don't um and yet if someone else says look becky's really trying the best she's trying to help you guys can you just give her a break for a day and actually that can have an amazing impact if i said the same thing do i know fuck off but yeah, if someone else says it and explains it to them and says this is why, they're usually quite responsive and they'll calm down a little. So it's something to look into. You can do university courses on it. Um, you can do, I think, do like six weeks or something like that. Um, maybe, or maybe two weeks. I don't know how long we did it for. Um, there's also like in voice hearing groups, there's people that will be able to do voice dialoguing with you. So it depends how you experience your parts as well, I guess. Um, some more things that are helpful is others remaining kind of calm and gentle to all your parts. So if you see someone who has a part at the front who you don't like, who is offensive to you, don't retaliate. That is the worst thing you can do. Never retaliate to an altar if you are someone else. Be calm, stay, stay steady, keep your voice quiet, don't raise your voice. Personally, if someone was to raise their voice at Caleb, he's just going to start shouting at them. If someone says to remain like on level, he will probably just calm down and relax and be like, oh, I see your point. Okay, sorry, right, bye. And that's it. The issue is done. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's hard to be accepting of the parts that we don't like and the parts that we don't agree with. But I think it's like a very important part to recovery is accepting all of them and realizing that every part that we have is there for a reason. They're not there to punish us, they're not there to try and hurt us, they're there because they had to come forward because we were hurt and we were scared. Um, and really, in a way, we should thank them. They're the ones that have taken the brunt of it over the years. Um, and so if you think about that, you, you look at people who've had a hard life and who've only had bad things happen pretty much, they get bitter sometimes, they get cynical, they get angry. And it's the same thing with parts. They've gone through so much that they're hostile to the world, they don't see it as safe. They don't see it as a good world to live in. They don't see it as a nice place. They don't see it as comfortable. So it's natural that some of them are going to be angry. It's natural that some of them are going to be hostile. And it's accepting and understanding why they're doing that. And I think if you can understand that they're not trying to be punishing, they're not trying to be negative, they're trying to protect you. And even when they're putting me down, I realise it's a safety thing. If I, have a, if I started to believe in myself and then I failed at something, that pain of losing that self image would be worse than, to me than never having it or at least that's what i think we all think on maybe a subconscious level um and so yeah in dissociation every part has a purpose every part has a value and it's they all have a message and, and something that we need to learn from them so that's something to keep in mind um sometimes we need treatment for other mental health illnesses we have going on too it's like depression and anxiety excuse me Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so if you've got depression and anxiety and dissociation, sometimes focusing on the other two can be helpful because it can then get you onto like a level ground where you can work on the dissociation. But as I say, it's all a circle. When you affect one part positively, the rest will shift positively too. It's just finding that point to start in. Uh, I've written also acceptance of all parts. They may seem negative, but they're there for a reason. We've talked about that. Uh, something good is sensory items like a weighted blanket, uh, a stress ball, uh, I'd say smelly candles, probably not a good idea if you dissociate so maybe not, but something like um, 
a bubble bath with either warm or cold water, whatever you need. Cold water is good to kind of shock you a little back, but being shocked back is never good, um, really, unless it's a very dire situation. But it's like it can, for me, cold water is amazing when I'm just so seeing. It calms me, it grounds me, and it, it just brings me back down a little. I don't know why, it just does. Uh, so some other sensory items could be like Play-Doh, I've mentioned like blankets. Um, it could be a cuddly toy, it could be soft clothes like pyjamas, soft socks, smellies. Um, you could do some soft soothing. You could have like a hot, a cold bath like I said, or a shower. Um, soft, sorry, sir, strong tastes as well are really good. So like fizzy and cold drinks or something like Coke. Um, not advertising, sorry. Uh, let me think. So yeah, things like mints. Coke, anything that's got a strong flavour, like Fisherman's Friends, if you like that, licorice, sherbet, something sour, anything that has that strong flavour or set that will be a strong sense will help ground you. And so some things that you can say to help what someone who is dissociating is remind them where they are, tell them that they're safe now, tell them where they are and who they're with is a big one. Um and explain who you are, so whether you're a friend, a partner, because they may not always know exactly right at the beginning. They may just need to, not a reminder of who you are, but like a reminder of where they are and what time and what place. And so talk in a calm and quiet voice, say their name um, if you ask a question and if no one answers, maybe ask who needs help right now. So for example, instead of saying, Becky, you're all right, and it's not Becky at the front, they might not answer. Um, if someone was to say, Oh, Caleb, are you at the front? And then he would you might get a no or yes. So use the specific names of the parts or the alters because it will get them to be more responsive, or at least that's what I find. Um anything just talk about anything in general, soothing, anything neutral. Um if they have faith, talk about God. If they have a pet, tell them about what their pet's doing. Oh, you know, Titch is on the windowsill right now, she's having a good look outside. Anything that can make you be more in the present moment and bring you back. Um, mindfulness is not something I would recommend with this, really. Uh, I'm not the only one that says that from talking to psychologists, which is good. Um, because mindfulness brings your awareness, yes, to the present, but to a very focused point. And if you are not in a good frame of mind, it can open all kinds of doors. Um, and it's, you've just got to be careful of mindfulness. I personally find it more harmful than good if I'm dissociating. If I'm stressed, brilliant. Dissociating, God no. <laughs> um, and so also a last thing that you can say is ask before you touch them. And as I say, if they don't reply or you don't get an affirmative yes, don't take that as an okay. If they haven't replied, just don't touch them. Unless you get a confirmation, do not do it because that could cause a lot of problems. You could trigger a flashback. You could trigger... Um, just a general freak out and over like a, a sensory overload you can make them angry it could scare them there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't um and some things that you can do so we've talked about some of these already you can give them something tactile a blanket a soft toy maybe a smooth stone that they can do that with and hold in their hand um give them their pet if it's safe to do so remind them of their current goals and the positives in their life uh, give them something to eat or drink so again something strong something fizzy maybe something cold or hot uh, not too hot because if it's burning them they may not be aware so warm to cold is probably best um, touch their arm or hand after asking or give them a hug but again after asking you could take them for a walk you could take them into the garden you could take them just outside getting away from the physical space that you're dissociating in can make a big difference uh, you could play a game with them, it distracts them and it focuses them on the present, whether it's a board game, a video game. If you're playing a game, you've got to be in it. And a video game is better than a board game for that, because in a board game, you usually take turns, there's time for pause. Playing a video game together, you've got to be in it. Um, and so that can be quite a good one to bring someone back and keep them focused. Things like TVs, radio, books, puzzles, favourite DVDs, CDs, ask them if they want any of them. You could take them somewhere quiet and calm or somewhere that's natural, like where there's lots of trees and a little river or somewhere pretty um, with as little stimulation as possible, though, is the stipulation there. 
And the key thing is to listen to all of their needs and the others, not just the ones that you like, not just the ones you've talked to, but all of them. Be accepting of all of them and their personalities. Okay, so on to what does not help. You'll have figured some of this out by what I've already said, but we'll go through it anyway. Now, this is number one. Big number one. Do not shake them. Do not jolt them. Do not scare them. Do not stun them. Do not do anything to try and forcibly bring them back. If they are gone, they're needing to be gone. If you bring them back forcibly, it can cause a lot of problems for them. It causes a lot of distress. It causes a lot of upset. And it really can make the situation 10 times worse in like a split second. Just please don't do it. The only way I would say you should ever bring someone back forcibly like that is if there's like a dire physical emergency and they have to they have to be present to get out of the way or they have to be present to get get somewhere safe. That is the only way I'd ever say do it. Um, I've had people try and force me back and it's all awful. Especially when you don't want to come back, you're not ready for it. it it's just so upsetting. And it's really painful, like you don't want to be there, you don't want to have to face what's going on. And for someone to force you back, it kind of feels rude and like they just don't care about your suffering and that they don't realise what they're doing. And I think that's it, people don't realise what they're doing, they don't realise how much it's damaging that person. Um, but it can be a big, big no-no. So yeah, just don't force a person to come back please. Um, and then the second big one obviously, no physical contact without touching. Um, no loud noises if possible, no sudden loud noises especially, no sudden touching, movement close to them. If you need to move in the room that you're in and you're near them, say, oh, I'm just standing up to get a tissue, I'm just going to go to the toilet. Let them know where you're going, let them know what you're going to do and let them know you're coming back. Um, yeah, that's that's a really important one. And so another thing that does not help is reacting angrily or reacting with hostility to other parts. We've talked about this earlier because it will just get met with more re more kind of resistance. If you treat them lovingly, if you treat them as a another human, you're going to get a much better response like than if you just go on the attack because you don't like what they said to you. And you have to realise if they say something, if a part says something, it's not the, the host that's saying that. It's not something they secretly think or secretly want to say. No, it's another part of them that isn't really them saying it. it, it they have no control over that. I've had Caleb say things to people and I've had to take the blame for it because people don't understand that it's not me. And it's awful. Like, they, people treat you differently when it's not you that they should be treating differently in a way. Or they treat you one way because of something else that you really shouldn't be judged on. Um... And so, yeah, hostility, anger is never going to help. Uh, judgment, laughter, ridicule, sarcasm, patronising, minimising their distress. These are like huge no-nos as well. It doesn't matter what you're thinking. It doesn't matter what the cause. Just don't do it. Be respectful. Be loving as best you can. Be accepting. No matter what you're thinking, be accepting of them and all their needs. And all, all of all of their needs. <laughs> like there for a reason i think that's the key thing um and so i'm just going to talk a little bit about treatment like recovery this is something i don't know much about i'm in the very early stages of recovery myself but i have done some reading up on it and seen what's kind of out there the key thing is of course talking therapies whether that's psychotherapy counseling um anything like that finding someone that you trust that you think you can do this work with someone who has a good knowledge of dissociation is very important um i've worked with people who have no idea what dissociation is they've got no clue don't know how to treat it don't know how to help me and yet i've been forced into seeing them because they're the only psychologist available in my area and it's like why make me see someone who can't give me the help i need just so they can say they've done something on paper oh well we gave her this um I'm going private currently and my friend is very, very generously paying for it right now. Um, and thank you, Cheryl, because that means the world. You give me a bit of hope when I had none. Um, and she's brilliant, my worker. Like, I do feel like I trust her. I feel like I can work with her. She's reliable. She seems to be honest. And these are all things that you want to have in a person before you start working with them. So if you're looking into a psychologist or counselling, I would highly recommend... 
meeting for an assessment and it's not just them assessing you but you assessing them and you thinking do i trust this person could i learn to trust this person what do i think about this room do i feel safe here and really think about that before you commit um but there is um a quote that i found it's from a neuroscience team's journal uh well sorry uh an an entry in a journal like a proper science journal and it says dissociation and did can be treated successfully because they originate from i'm getting this wrong i'm sorry dissociation and dis dissociation can be treated successfully because they it originates from mechanisms which is not pathological per se hence dissociation and dissociative disorders are reversible subject to appropriate treatment so that's the key part they are reversible so what you have is reversible but subject to appropriate treatment so that's what you've got to focus on is finding that appropriate treatment for you and it could be completely different for so many different people um talking therapies counseling medication voice dialoguing compassion towards parts non-violent communication openness honesty compassion um and being honest with people not just your parts not just you but other people around you your workers it really does help and if you if you're lying to people you're not going to get anywhere i understand that we all have shameful things and there's certain things that i've been tempted to lie about in my dissociation because i'm, I'm ashamed of it but i've kind of had to realize that there's no point lying it's only me that suffers if i don't tell someone the truth they don't care they're not going to know otherwise like why bother if you want help, you're going to have to be willing to be honest about it. And that's really scary because a lot of the stuff that dissociation is caused by is stuff that no one wants to talk about, especially things like sexual abuse or any form of childhood abuse. It's not, no one wants to talk about that. It's not a comfortable subject in terms of opening up about it. Um, so yeah, honesty, really big thing. And I say that in all my videos, I know, but it's it's huge. So to sum this video up, dissociation is a very debilitating and difficult disorder to have, especially as it comes with the knowledge that there's been abuse in your past, whether you have memories of this or not usually. Um, personally, my dissociation affects me daily in pretty much everything. So relationships, handling emotions, uh, forming and keeping memories, ability to concentrate even on small tasks. Uh, let me see, like, it affects the ability to work and function just on a basic level. And there are days when I can do something like this and not dissociate too much. But there are other days that I try and film a video that's lighter than this. And there's like half an hour of me just sat there staring at the camera and I'm not there. Like, I, I, I've got to edit all that out, obviously. Um, and so you may see me like this, but trust me, and this is like when we pull together and we're like, right, we're going to do this. Let's work together. Let's do one thing together get it done and then we can fall to bits again um but yeah i don't know i don't know so i mean like i've mentioned about not even being able to use the oven in case i forget it's on and start a fire i'm literally classed as a fire risk according to my like assessments because of that and the fact that my i'm a hoarder so there's shit everywhere in my flat um quality drunk no quality gear that's better quality gear full of quality gear um and i like to think my others would keep her safe but i can't guarantee that especially with hope she's a kid she, she's not a responsible adult how can she keep us all safe so really it's down to me and adam to look after caleb and hope and that gets exhausting it does um yes yeah, so basically that's it that's all i really wanted to say I thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope you learnt something in this video. If you did, leave a comment and let me know. That would make my day. Uh, like and subscribe. That would be cool. Turn the notification bell on so that you know when I do a new, a new video. Um, I'm going to start doing a live stream about once a week on a regular day. I'm wondering what times you guys would like because I'm in England, which is GMT time. Uh, so right now for me... That's not going to help. Sorry, ignore me. I don't know what time it is right now. Um, but yeah, if you guys could let me know where you live, just like a country, what time you would like um, a live stream to be. And then I can try and figure out when's the best for everyone. And um, we'll try to do that. That'd be cool. I had a great chat with Lex last time. Thank you for coming in. Syria Matrix, I'm sorry you left so quickly, but nice to see you. Um, and that's it, guys. Yeah, thank you for watching. Stay cool. Stay safe. Bye.